Uh, so I'm like everybody. All right. Usually I'm not sitting. Uh, I've I did stand-up comedy for six, 16 years, and usually I'm standing. This is a sit-down, but it's not comedy. Uh, this is alhamdulillah um, something more important than comedy. As I said, I did comedy for 16 years, and uh, alhamdulillah I did these shows all around the world, about 400 of them. Audience is as large as 40,000 people, but I never really felt fulfillment. Uh, so I'll give you guys a little background and why I'm here and why I am part of the whole marriage scene of helping single Muslims find the other half. And that's where I actually found fulfillment. Uh, so myself, I've, about the age of 20 years old, I became Muslim. I was born into a Persian family that was extremely secular and they don't practice any type of religion whatsoever. My grandfather was the one who brought the refrigerator and the automobile to Iran. So he became what you would say almost like today's like billionaire status. In fact, there's multiple people within my family still right now, multiple that are in the billionaire status. But what happened was when we came, my family used to go on vacation all around the world. By the time I was four years old, I've been to Europe, to here. I've been actually came to the United States. And when we came here to Southern California, well, not Southern, I'm in Northern California. When I came to California, uh, my family came to on vacation. And the revolution happened, and we ended up staying here. As we stayed up here, um, me have absolutely no idea what Islam is, and my parents hiding it from me. Um, I grew up in a very tough situation, going through a lot of challenges because there's no Islam to guide me. And uh, the, re my the reason why my parents hid it from me is because in Iran, the extremely wealthy are as secular as possible, and the people who are not wealthy are as religious as possible. And there's that division between the two. So not only did they not teach Islam to me, but it was kind of hidden from me. Uh, so to their shock, I actually discovered Islam in Los Angeles. And I became Muslim overnight. And many of my friends also became Muslim overnight. And that shocked my parents. So much so that my father started hitting his head against the wall, and my mother started screaming. How did you find this religion? And how did you find it in America, of all places? And at that time, there was only like one masjid in our entire community. Today, you have about six or seven within like the same community. But it was, even at that time in the 90s, it wasn't very popular. I mean, average American didn't know what Islam was. So for me to discover, it was very shocking to them. And as I discovered this religion, and I eventually, alhamdulillah, started learning more and more, um, alhamdulillah, I quickly learned, as soon as I discovered the religion, uh, and I accepted it, that what Islam teaches and what Muslims do are two different things. And I say, Alhamdulillah, Allah showed me Islam before he showed me the Muslims. So, <laughs> so when I eventually got to the age of, like, not age, but getting to the time of looking to get married, and like many of us have gone through, or maybe going through right now, I wasn't looking to get married. I was just learning about Islam, like brand new to Islam. So I'm going to tell you guys my quick story of how my struggle started for marriage and say fix some resembles some things that you may have gone through. So I couldn't go through my family uh, if I wanted to get married. Uh, my parents are not religious whatsoever. I couldn't go through my friends because they're all single like me. And I couldn't go through my community because they had no programs like they have here in MCC. MCC, by the way, let me just take a quick note here. I'm, this is a free plug for MCC, and they're not p telling me to tell you guys this. But I've been through all these masjids from all around the United States, actually around different parts of the world. And I have rarely seen a masjid like MCC that cares so much about the Muslims and cares so much about especially the single Muslims and trying to help them. And uh, my, hats goes, hat, my hat goes off to them, alhamdulillah, uh, because they're amazing. Uh, they're very unique. So you are blessed to be part of this community. Not most communities do not have anything like this. With that said, when I was looking to, uh, eventually, I came to a point in my life that um, I started learning more and more about Islam. About, I'm about a year, year and a half into Islam at this point. I go to an Islamic conference. Have anyone heard of ISNA before? Do you guys know what ISNA stands for? I'm single and available. Oh. Yeah, I, I didn't know that until I went to the conference. I thought it was something to do with teaching. 
Uh, so, so I went there to learn um, and to be at the bazaar and all this other stuff. And what I quickly realized when I went there is a lot of people are looking to get married. And I wasn't even looking to get married. I was just like going there to like meet friends and other things. And um, what happened is I was selling this one product at my booth. And uh, this one sister would keep coming back to the booth asking to buy the product, but she couldn't buy it because she had Canadian dollars. And she said, I need to find a place to exchange the money so I can buy your product. And the product was only like $5. It was nothing. But she said, can you hold one for me? So I held one for her. And she came back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And eventually, on the last day of the conference, she said, Ali, sorry, I could not find anywhere that exchanges Canadian dollars to US dollars here at the conference. Just sell it to somebody else. And I said, sister, just take it. And she's like, are you sure? I said, yeah, take it. Of course, this is only $5. Just go. She took it. She left. As she took the product and walked away, the brother who was standing next to me did this. Hey, what was that? Like, what do you mean? He said, I was watching you and how you talk to every single person at this conference, and you didn't talk to anyone the way you talked to her. You didn't look at anyone the way you looked at her. There's something, something that is about her that caught your interest. And I, and I said, look, just because I gave her a free product? No, 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 no. I'm watching. And he said, Ali, I came to the conference with the intention of finding a wife. My friend came to the conference with the intention of finding a wife. I know you didn't come, but what if, what if that is your future wife? If you don't go and speak to that sister for marriage, you'll always ask yourself, what if? And I kind of froze because I wasn't even thinking about marriage. I wasn't really thinking about her for marriage, and now I'm thinking to myself, what if? <laughs> so, so I'm like, I don't know what to do. This year is like 1990-something, in the late 90s. And I'm like, oh, what do I do? What do I say? So what I did is I asked him for a piece of paper. And I got the piece of paper, and uh, I, I quickly wrote, was writing something down. And he said, what are you writing? Go, she, you, she's leaving. I said, hold on, let me think, let me think. I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, I, wrote a piece, I wrote it down on a piece of paper, and I'm, and I'm saying, okay, I know what I want to do now. So I'm walking around the conference, and I'm trying to look for the sister who's wearing a white hijab. <laughs> And I quickly realized there's a lot of sisters wearing white hijab. So I'm like, Salam alaikum. Oh, that's not her. Salam alaikum. Oh, that's not her. And eventually, I gave up. And I started walking back towards a direction. And as I'm walking back, she's walking away. And we, we see each other. And I'm like, Salam alaikum. And she's like, Wa alaikum salam. And she walks right past me. OK, this is getting really awkward. So I'm like, how do I do this? So I like, turn right, 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 right around in front of her. I say, Salam alaikum, sister. This is Assalamu alaikum, hello, not Assalamu alaikum, goodbye. Um, I wrote a, uh, my contact information on this piece of paper. I was wondering if you were single and if you were looking to get married. If you're open to speaking to me, just contact me. If you're not open to it, just throw the paper away. Uh, but don't throw the paper away until I walk away, because it will hurt my feelings. OK, I saw my goodbye. And I just walked away. I just gave her the paper, and I walked away. I walked left and right and left and right all the way till I walked back to the booth. When I got back to the booth, the brother was uh, telling He went and told all the brothers what I was doing. Now, everybody's wondering, I didn't think you were looking to get married. Who is this sister? What's going on? What was on that piece of paper? And as I start explaining this entire story to them, they all start smiling. And I'm like, and they're like, like you guys are smiling. And then suddenly, I remember the guy specifically, his name was Amr from Milwaukee. He would do this. <gasps> I'm like, why is he doing <gasps> for? And I keep talking. I'm a male brain, so I'm not really thinking smart. So I keep talking and talking and talking. And until every single brother stopped smiling, and they just stared at me like this. And then I realized something's wrong, and I said, is she behind me? <laughs> so now I'm thinking to myself, this sister probably thinks I did this as a joke, and this whole thing was a joke, and I came back to tell the guys all, ha, 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 she doesn't know what my intention was, and blah, 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 so I'm like, what should I tell her? But then at this, on the back of my head, I was thinking, also, she, I don't know how much she's heard, and how much she hasn't heard, so I turned around, and I said, assalamu alaikum. And she's like, wa alaikum salam. And every single brother, like seven of them, are behind the booth staring at us. I'm staring at her, she's staring at me. And for like this four seconds of awkward silence, and she's like, OK, I just came back to let you know that here's my dad's contact, so you can just contact him. I said, OK, is that it? She's like, yeah, what else would there be? I'm like, no, nothing. 
So, <laughs> so I took that contact information, contacted the father, um, went down and met the father. There's a whole story behind it. And you think this part was crazy? That's 10 times more crazier. But long story short, I married that sister. And what happened was two years later, I was in a divorce situation. So there was nothing wrong with the sister. I will never speak negative about her. It was that I found someone and we just saw each other on the surface, but we didn't have any type of deep compatibility. And we didn't discover that until after we were married. And after we were married, we didn't like typical fights where husband and wife are like divorcing because it's all this emotions and people are yelling at each other and it's just like really, really messy. It wasn't like that. We were just mutual realized that we are not connected. I mean, she, the stuff she would say and the stuff I was thinking of, like one day she would like say, we should sell all our belongings and just be like nomads going from Europe to here to there. I'm like, that sounds good, but not realistic. But, and then her world was completely different than mine. And I realized that we're going two different directions. So did she. And we say, if we have children, it's going to get really, really complicated. So we decided mutually to separate. Even though the, all that uh, emotions were in there, it still, it still hurt me more than anything that hurt me in my life. And after I experienced that, I said, I never want to go through this again. I'm going to do everything I can so I never feel this pain again. So I can only imagine people who had really bad uh, experiences through marriage, what they feel like. They're probably 10 times worse than that. So you have this fear of ever getting married again. You have this fear of ever wanting to, uh, let's make yourself vulnerable so you become into a painful situation. So at that point, instead of blaming her or the situation or all the stuff that happened, I told myself, what could I have done to make that marriage better? What can I do to be a better husband if I get married again? So what I started doing is I started studying these books about how men communicate, how women communicate, how the differences between different types of personalities, the different types of way people do things, how people handle stress differently, all these different layers I never even thought about. I didn't even know it existed. And as I studied and studied and studied, I realized that I think I'm ready to get married. And this time around, I will fall into the same trap of looking just for surface. I will see something deeper than that. I will find compatibility. So I decided to do the unthinkable in 2001. I went on the internet to look for a wife. And the same 2001 and 2023, there's two different worlds, guys. In 2001, the internet is brand new. I mean, most people are using it for most things. They just barely have Hotmail and email and yahooing everything. There is no one's barely using it for anything like serious. It's not like it is today. So when you go and say, I'm going to go find my wife or husband on the internet, it was like really, really weird. But I can go through my parents. And go th I can go through the local masjid. I had to go online. As I go online and I'm looking for my uh, other half, I was like, which website works? Probably questions you guys probably asked yourself. Which one of these works? I don't know which one works. So I joined all of them. But I don't want to talk to a bunch of sisters. I said I want to talk to one sister, just one. So what I did is I made a very, very detailed profile, exactly what you're going to get if you marry me. These are the pluses, and here's the negatives. These are the things I'm expecting in a wife, and these are the things you should expect in a husband, blah, 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 blah. And I was hoping just one person responds. Unfortunately, well, I don't want to say unfortunately, but I had a, I had a problem where 17 people responded. Now, the problem was because I joined all these websites. If I joined one website, I probably wouldn't have 17 people responding. But 17 people responded, and that right there, I realized the websites were broken. That something's wrong here. That there's no way there's 17 people interested in me. So either they're telling me what I want to hear, or maybe one of them or two of them are actually being sincere and they're telling me the truth. So I need to filter all these people out because I don't have the time or patience or the mental capacity to talk to 17 people. I want to talk to one sister. So what I did is I came up with a series of questions that didn't have right or wrong answers, and I sent it to all 17 sisters. Only one of them answered it correctly. The problem was, I was hoping she lives in California, but she lives in London. It's like, that's really far away. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us in pairs, but I don't know where, my other, where he created the other pair, where he made the other half of me. I assume, and many of us assume, we hope they're in Northern California. We hope they're Pakistani or Indian or Arab or African-American or whatever. You assume 
and make these false assumptions sometimes where they live right now, what their ethnicity is, and what their age is, and all these other things. But you don't know that. All we know is that Allah made us in pairs. Where is my pair? Allah knows best. And I thought to myself, let me go meet this sister. And I did. And I married her 22 years ago. I'm, as soon as I met her, well, well, let me tell you what happened. I had conversations back and forth with the sister and asking her questions that didn't have right or wrong answers. And I did this for months, for about three months. As soon as all the questions have been asked, I said, this, if I can see her and she sees me, because it has to be mutual, if there's chemistry, I'll know in a few seconds. Because all the rest of the boxes have been checked. So when I met, went to meet her, I said, I have to meet, I want to do everything the halal way. Uh, we're going to meet in a public place. And she sat on a park bench. I, st I stood up. And it was really awkward. And we were in a public park. And there was this halal gap. It's like social distancing before COVID, right? So I'm like six foot distancing. And as soon as I meet her, I knew she was the one. And I can tell from the smile and the, her shyness, she thinks I'm the one. But we don't know what to do after this point because like, there's no manual of what you're supposed to do next. So at that point, I got nervous. And I had a little handheld camera with me that I brought only to sightsee because I said, look, if I want to go to London to meet the sister, it may work out, may not work out. At the very least, let me record a bunch of this footage to send to my friends. Well, I, uh, while I was sightseeing, I had this camera in my bag. And I totally forgot. And I put my hand in the bag. And the camera was there. And I took it out. And I don't know what to do because I'm just using this as my safety blanket. And she's like, and this was completely unplanned. She's like, what's that for? I said, um, what if one day we get married and our kids ask us, how did you guys meet? <laughs> this is the exact words I told her, by the way. And she gets all super nervous. And I started recording that footage from the moment that I met her, literally 20 minutes after I met her, to the day we got married, which was nine days later. And I presented to her in a movie on DVD with all the things to her, like a movie poster, like, like a legit, real movie. It's a two-hour film. I gave it to her after we got married, five years after marriage. And her response was, OK, I'll watch it later. <laughs> I told my wife she's the most hardest person in the world to impress. I've done so many things for my wife. And she's like, eh, OK, eh, OK. But alhamdulillah, she brings me down to earth a lot. So. Um, that 22 years of marriage have been, Allah is my witness, I still feel like a newlywed till today. And I wanted to help others find the other half, and that's why I put myself into the marriage space of saying, how can I give the people the tools they can to get married? Let me tell you guys some of the challenges we have as, as a person who was a divorcee, not married, but still experienced divorce. As most of you guys have heard some of the statistics, but some of them you may not know, that the divorce rate here in the United States is about 50%. Like non-Muslim. Muslims are not that far off, by the way. But what you don't know is that in California, we're in the top 10 states of divorce. In fact, in California, we're at 60% divorce rate. We're higher than other states. Uh, the second thing that you may or may not know is that a lot of these divorces, about 43% of them, are dealing with children involved. And these are children under the age of 18. This makes it quite challenging oftentimes. So it's not just, OK, in my situation, it's a lot easier because I can separate. But when there's children involved, you can't, they don't divorce their father and they don't divorce their mother. The parents are no longer connected, but they are always going to be connected. And that always makes things a bit more complicated as well. The other challenges we have is that overall in the United States, 70%, contrary to what most people believe, because your experience may make you have one belief to it, but I'm talking about, in general, what are most people experiencing. 70% of all the divorces that are happening in the United States are considered no-fault divorce. This is where they have said there was no abuse on, from the male or female. There was no drugs. There was no abandonment. There was no alcohol. It's just there's no fault. And the number one answer that's come across is that we've grown apart. And you guys are nodding because you guys heard this quite a bit and you guys experienced this because people have certain expectations of what marriage life will be like. And let me tell you where some of these expectations have been now put on steroids in our generation now that they didn't have in just one generation ago when I was looking to get married. This. This phone, when people wake up, this is the first thing that most of us check. This is what we do when we get bored. 
This is what we do when we stand in line. This is what we do all the time. We're, if you're in class, if you're at work, wherever the situation is, you're swiping, 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 swiping. As you're swiping, you are seeing things. And sometimes our heart, our brains are not thinking while we're seeing things because when you used to, kids used to watch television, our parents used to say, oh, that's not real life. And you can separate the two. Oh, those are actors. And sometimes when you're a kid, you can't separate it. Things are so scary for you because it feels like it's so real. But as you grow older, you realize that this is all acting and this is our movies and behind the scenes. You go to Universal Studios and oh, blah, 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 blah. But when you're watching things on social media, these people look like me. And I don't see camera sets. I don't see scripts. And they seem to feel very natural. You're watching couples and they're um, like your friends and people you know in the community, and look what they're doing today, and look what they're going today, and look what all the amazing experiences they're having today, and then you look at your spouse and like, what's wrong with us? What are, why aren't we doing this type of stuff? So now people const constantly comparing themselves to other people, wondering why is their experience so different than mine? And what you don't realize, that the same couples that are putting this show on for you are probably having more problems than you are but they only show the best parts online. They only show you the parts that they're not fighting. In fact, most of your friends who ended up getting divorced, how many times would you all did you see it coming? And how often did you say, wow, who got divorced? Why do we get shocked sometimes? The reason why we get shocked is because when we see people from the outside, we don't know what's happening behind closed doors. We don't know this guy who's like so charming, everyone in the community loves him, how he treats his wife. You have no idea. She knows. Maybe her, even her kids know. But you don't know this person. You don't know her. You don't know him. They know each other. So when they get divorced, it didn't just say, okay, overnight they're going to get divorced. It's happened and just built up and built up and built up. And now we see it all happen. And we get shocked. And the reason we get shocked is because we don't see the negative side. And we don't see this negative side on social media. And so we don't compare the negative stuff that we experience. We only ex experience, oh, they're having so, such amazing positive experiences. I'm not having those, so maybe something's wrong with me. Maybe something's wrong with my marriage. And to let you guys know, and just a reminder for us, alhamdulillah, one beautiful thing we have about Islam is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and we have his example. And if he's the greatest man to ever walk on this planet, and he has the highest level of Jannah guaranteed for him, and he has experience of challenges with his own wife and wives. At one point, he said, I'm going to leave everyone for like 30 days. And this is the greatest man to ever walk on this planet that tells us that this different relationships that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put for us, the differences between males and differences between females, and you put them together, and that, that's friction or sometimes conflict that can happen, that is natural. That if you guys are arguing with your husband or your wife, it is normal. It's like almost expecting to get to move to an area and having no bad weather ever. Even the most tropical, most beautiful vacation spots, they have tornadoes sometimes come, hurricanes sometimes come. And at the time of the hurricane, it feels like this is the worst experience ever. This weather is not going to stop. It's going to happen, it's going to go on and go on and go on. But the wiser people, they know that this is just temporary. That no matter how bad this feels right now, the weather cannot just keep raining forever. Unless you live in London or Seattle. But in general, it doesn't like rain forever. It's eventually going to take a break. So if we make a decision about let's move when it's like going through a thunderstorm, maybe we should just, okay, hold on a little bit, wait till the thunderstorm clears out, then make a decision when we are like cooler heads prevail, inshallah. So all of these different things I've learned is helping me to make better decisions now. And that's why I come into like this type of event to share some of these things with you. I read somewhere that intelligence is when you learn from your own mistakes. But wisdom is when you learn from the mistakes of others. Let that sink in for a second. What many of us will go through an experience of divorce and the first thing you learn is, now I know what I can't be married to, right? Before that, what was it? It was so much easier to get married, wasn't it? Before that, our idea was, oh, these are all the things I want in a husband, or these are all the things I want in a wife. As long as this person has this, I will get married, inshallah. Now, it's harder for us. Not necessarily just because society makes it harder for us, but because we sometimes make it harder for us. We have trauma or negative experiences from our ex, and now 
we are judging the future person, maybe uh, you may have some sort of things, even though they haven't done anything to us yet. We may have these negative emotions towards the opposite gender because we have experienced negative things from the opposite gender, even though the person we're speaking to has done none of these negative things to us. Maybe our ex was stingy or mistreated us or did certain things or whatever. And now we have these negative experiences and we have this healing that we haven't done and we're going to carry it over to them, which is unfair. It would be unjust if someone did that to you. And I think one of the hurdles that we have to pass through is like giving up some of these things, uh, these negative feelings we have. And it's hard. I'm, I'm making it sound easy, but it's not easy. It's extremely hard. That time when I went through the divorce, it was one of the most toughest times in my life. And I've experienced a lot of negative things in my life, but that is something that is hard to explain to people who haven't been through it. You know, it's like my friend, he buried his child recently. No matter how much I can say I can understand your pain or I can feel your pain, I can't. Until you bury your own child, you'll never feel that pain. Similarly, when my friends have children, I tell them, I said, you'll never know how much your parents actually loved you until you have your own child. No matter how many times our parents told us, I love you, I love you, I love you, even though we love our parents, we can never love them the way they love us. So no matter how much I tell my friends who don't have children, like the way you start loving this being who just entered this world, more than sometimes you're even your own parents, why? Is because Allah subhanahu built this love inside of you. So it's hard to express the pain sometimes that we go through through our challenges of divorce unless we're talking to people who went through the same thing as us. And that's why I think we need people who have been through this to be part of the solution. See, so I started this matrimonial website, Hafardin, as the sister mentioned in an introduction, back in 2010 with my partner, Sir Faz. And when we started this, we had different ways to go about this. And we learned from certain things, mistakes. And one of the things, sometimes I make decisions which make absolutely no financial sense whatsoever, that actually have hit me financially negatively, but I think it's the right thing to do. And if I didn't go through these negative marriage experiences or divorce, I probably would have not made those decisions because I would not know any better. I'll give you one of the decisions I made, was to remove the divorce status from your profiles. You cannot tell who's divorced and who's not. Just like in this room, I have no idea who's divorced and who's not. Nobody has a label that says, oh, I'm single, I'm divorced, I'm widowed. We don't have those labels within us. Unfortunately, we have become accustomed to defining ourselves this way. Just because you went through a divorce doesn't mean you're a bad person. But in this society today, they say, oh, you're a divorcee. That's your status. Add that to your profile. And what they do, the only reason, by the way, they ask you on the websites if you're divorced or not, only one reason, is to filter you out. Not them, but the people, so give the ability to the other users to filter out, I only want people who are single only. So therefore, you're paying for a website where no one can ever see you. You're literally invisible. But we really don't think about it from that perspective because we're, not, we're thinking from the user perspective, the, the person who's using the website. But if you think it from the administration perspective, this is the reason they ask. So I said, I don't want people to filter divorcees out because it's not fair. And as I said, if something you've experienced doesn't make you a bad person. Let's say, for example, I'm, a, I'm on the street down here and I'm standing at a red light. Out of nowhere, it's me standing at a red light, a car hits me. If on paper, I have been in an accident. Does that make me a bad driver? It can make them a bad driver. Oh, they just hit me from nowhere. But we are both in an accident, even though it doesn't show who's at fault. So if you're in a divorce status, if you're in a divorce status, nobody knows what your fault was. You don't know what the story was. A person whose every divorce is different. There's times that a divorce happens. You have absolutely you try everything you can to make the marriage work, but you get the exact same status as your ex. How is that fair? Unfortunately, it's not. And this is sometimes I don't think some the people who are the people who are running the show or paying attention to these things. So I said, I'm gonna to try to be a difference, difference maker. Let me try to do things differently. I don't want to label people by divorce. Let's just, everyone's the same. Now, does that mean that you don't tell people that you went through divorce? You do, but I want them to get to know you first. Let them know you first, and then if the divorce status is so important, then figure that part out next. You know what I mean? So 
where we do like our like like a typical matchmaking event. And by the way, we've done many in this room here. Um, when we do a typical matchmaking event, or typical organizations, not us, they say this is the range that we are accepting applications. You have to be either between the ages of 22 to 40. So you go and apply for this thing, and then uh, you're like, wait a second, 22 to 40, I'm 41, I can't get in. Well, sorry, but what can I do? Nothing. We have nothing for you. <laughs> what do we have nothing for me? This, so you tell me, there's no one in this world that wants to marry a 41-year-old person? What the other 41-year-olds? What are we helping them? Nobody. If you go to Ista, Mass, Ikna, all these people, look at this, there's a hard cap. I have a question. Who decided this hard cap? Who decided that now that I'm 41 that you're not worth getting married to? Like, can I just meet the other 40-year-olds that, that want to get married and just let us? Nope. We don't even have a space for that. You guys, sorry. So I'm like, this really bothers me. Really, really bothered me. The second thing is, okay, we have a divorced-only event for only divorcees. So we only have this only. What? Why? So a person who's, this before, who's never been divorced before will never marry someone who's divorced? That's not true. My wife was never divorced. She married a divorcee. So, and we've been happily mar married for 22 years. It doesn't define me. Again, if I, was, if I have negative characteristics, judge me by those things, not because of something I experienced. So then you go to these single events, by the way, and then what happens in all this type of stuff is I always wonder to myself, are they really in the business of helping people get married or the business of being in business? And that's where I find that even us divorce situation is a business. I'll give you guys some examples from the non-Muslim world. How divorce makes a lot of money. A lot of money. Aside from the stuff that you already probably know, which is probably attorneys and other things of nature. Let's say sister from this side and brother from this side, they get married. What will happen? Well, one of them will not need to live wherever they're living right now, so that rental space will be up for grabs. That apartment building or home will now be available to be sold, and now they have a vacancy that wasn't there before. But now let's multiply this by hundreds. Hundreds of sisters are marrying, hundreds of brothers, they all get married, and so now we have hundreds of homes and apartments available for rent. What does that do to the price? When the demand is not as high as the supply, the price drops. Now reverse it. Everyone in this room, imagine we're all married to each other, and everyone in this room suddenly gets divorced. Now all the, half of you will now need to find a place to live. If all the people are trying to find a place to live, that is going to make the price of rent jump up, like skyrocket. That's number one. And when the price skyrockets, guess what goes up also? Property tax. So more property tax, the houses are worth more, more money out of your pocket. Your income tax. Oh, you're single now. Fantastic. We are going to tax you like crazy. Single status versus married status is a big jump. Next. I, I, I can keep going on and on and on, but it just keeps adding up. And, and I'm telling you that this entire business of pe keeping society keeping us divorced and they're not helping us get married, I don't think it's just a coincidence. There is no incentive. And I'm not saying they're evil, society. I think it's just a financial business side of it. There was a statistics that came out from, uh, from CNN saying by the year 2030, 45% of women will never have children and will never get married. 45%. You know who did that study? Merrill Lynch. It is not a oh, social study and we're trying to figure out how we can solve. No, Merrill Lynch is a financial company who is looking to, for something called the she economy. They're saying, what can we sell women when they're all going to be divorced and they'll never be married in their life? What can we sell them? What can we make more money on and what should we invest in? Antidepressants, alcohol, makeup, Botox, all those things, clothes, all the stuff that typical single people, I'm talking about non-Muslims, hopefully, inshallah, that do that uh, married people don't do. Married people are more likely to save money. Married people are more likely to do, to be more stable, less risky behavior. Uh, less of this, less of that. So let's find out if we can get these people divorced. Let's see how much money we can make off of them. And we, as Muslims, we have to stop listening to all this nonsense. And a lot of this nonsense is coming through us, through our phones. Remember I told you guys earlier that how the social media is so different than the movies because a movie you can press it off switch. You're not watching movies 24 hours, 7 days a week. But social media, we're on it all the time. 
And when social media feeds you something and tells you, for example, um, oh, you don't like women? Oh, you're, you're a feminist? Or you're a red pill? I'm not going to say you're right or wrong. I'm just going to feed you whatever you've been watching. I'm going to double down on it, triple down, quadruple down. So all you get on your phone is this feed that's just over emphasizing the nonsense you already believe in. If you hate men, we'll, ma we'll make sure we show you every single video of every man who's done everything wrong to his wife. If you hate women, oh, we have this pill called red pill for you. Every single man, we'll show you how evil women are. They're all here for take your money. They're all this. They're all evil. And what happens is because you're constantly fed this information, you forget for a moment that this is just your feed, personalized. The person who's sitting next to you is not getting this feed. They're getting two different feeds. If you don't believe me, make a separate account and start watching different types of videos and watch how your feed every single day changes with this feed here. I have two accounts, one for Baba Ali and one for Half Ardeen. They're completely different. They're feeding me what they want to feed me. And this goes back to Fox News and MSNBC. There was one time before any of that stuff, by the way, when the news was just there to inform you. Now they're like comfort food, just feed you the nonsense. So you think Muslims are terrorists? Here's every single video of negative people sh sh shouting uh, Allahu Akbar and all this crazy stuff, which is like 99% of Muslims don't even act like this, but that's, if you're a Fox News watcher, you may only see that aspect of it if you're growing up 10 years ago. But if you're watching some other channel, you don't think that way. So now based on what channel you're watching, I have to figure out what type of opinion you have about me and what type of social media you have on your feed will also tell you what you think about me. Uh, but yeah. So that was me. I want to give you guys some information. And hopefully, if you found anything beneficial of uh, anything I said, um, they keep me in your du'as. Now, I'm a much more of a solution-oriented person. So I'm going to give you guys some, I don't know how much time I have, but I'm going to give you guys some solutions of what you can do that's actually in your hands. I'll just mention it just really quick, inshallah. So I put some notes for myself, and I said, what are some things? Because I thought to myself, like, look, we're going to tell you, oh, you're this age, nobody wants to marry you. Oh, you're divorced as, nobody wants to marry you. Oh, you're this, this ethnicity, nobody wants to marry you. Blah, blah, blah. By the way, all those negative things I was hearing when I was looking to get married. All that stuff. And I'm a convert too, and I'm Persian. There ain't no Persians coming to the mustard, guys. Sorry to say. Nobody. I don't know every other ethnicity there is, but I, for whatever reason, I don't know what happened to Persians. They are not associated with religion whatsoever. You see them at the college campus, you see them at work. They say weird stuff, like say hi to God for me, but they don't actually, <laughs> you don't see them at the masjids. So for me to go to the masjid and look for like a Persian lady, no way. I, like, I don't care about ethnicity. I don't see color. I just want to find a good sister for marriage. That's it. My wife is from Kenya, by the way. She's not from my eth ethnic background. She doesn't speak the same mother language as me. We're completely different. We don't have the same interests, but alhamdulillah, things work out. So I thought to myself, what can I give advice to people that they have actually control over that will make them attractive? And as I'm telling you these things, I want you to imagine a brother or a sister that you're speaking to for marriage, and they have these attributes, and tell me they don't suddenly become a little bit more attractive in your eyes. All right? Here's the things I came up with that I said that makes people attractive. Ten traits that make you more attractive. Number one, someone who is content. With whatever Allah has given you, you're content, you're grateful. Imagine a husband or a wife with whatever situation you, they are in, inshallah, things will get better, but whatever situation they are, they're content. Having a husband or wife in that situation is 10 times easier than someone who's always, always uh, disgruntled. Number two, someone who holds themselves accountable for where they are now and they don't blame others. They take accountability. So instead of just saying, my ex, my ex, my ex, look, I'm not going to talk negative about my ex. I want to look, rather look internally and say, what could I have done to be a better person? What could I do to be better? If you have that mindset, and you're talk, sisters, you're talking to a brother, and he says, listen, I'm not going to talk negative about my ex. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide her or give her the best husband in the world. But I realize that some of the things I would, could have done better would have been this, this, and this. And those are the things I've improved on. And when he says something like that, it's so much more attractive than if you're hearing him, yeah, let me tell you how bad she was, and blah, 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 and like, okay, is he going to be talking to, to, about me like this? You know, so number three, someone who is quick to forgive and late to anger. Being able to hold your tongue in times where there's, especially when there's a lot of emotions and conflict going on, that has a lot of value. 
if you have a husband or wife, a spouse, that is able to do that, is priceless. And that will lead a lot of, uh, remove a lot of unnecessary arguments and, and disputes. Next, and this is from the hadith of the Prophet Wasallam. someone who is most beneficial to others. There's a hadith, there's many hadiths that are very similar. Uh, one is the uh, best of you who's best to his wives. But one is specifically, and this is my favorite hadith, it's a very long hadith, but it's my favorite of all the hadiths of the Prophet Wasallam. It's one that's the, it, it, this beginning of it starts off with something uh, along the lines of the ones, the one, best of you is the one who's most beneficial to others. Um, and then if you have a husband or wife that has a mentality of being beneficial, and you'll see people, by the way, in, lo in local masjids, in the local community, those who are always beneficial to others, when those people are missing, they are truly missed. It's people like, where is so-and-so? You know, everyone misses these people, and you can be that person. And again, this isn't, there's nothing that prevents us from having any of these attributes. The next one, number five. Someone who doesn't compromise their dean, even if it puts them in an awkward situation. All of us have been in that situation. It's where we ha being Muslim in this environment is very easy. But sometimes being Muslim in a different environment is not so easy, especially if you're the only Muslim. I can't tell you how many times I've been on a flight where I'm praying and people are talking to me. <laughs> I'm at the airport. How many times, like all these r random stuff happens and I'm the only Muslim in this area that's like, I don't know if there's other Muslims in the airport or whatever, but I'm praying. So it happens, but I don't care. Like, and the fact that they don't care, uh, that says a lot. They don't, uh, next one. Uh, someone who has the life skills that will make him a good husband or wife. This is something that's missing from our generation right now, by the way. A lot of people are like, I want this, 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 this in a spouse. Okay, what do you bring to the table? They're like, uh, what? I said, what do you bring? Like, what life skills do you have that your spouse will find beneficial as a good husband or as a good wife? Right? So what can you do? And people don't know. So you have to develop these life skills. And there's a lot of them, by the way. For both male and female, learning how to cook will save you a lot of money, guys. A lot of money. Right? And that's a good skill to have. Our parents had it. Well, we just, for some reason, we don't have it. Our generation is missing it. We have DoorDash. Someone who is humble, and the number seven, there's only ten of them. Someone who is humble, has a humble personality, even with the gifts that Allah Subhanahu has blessed them with. If you're humble and you have no, no gifts, uh, it's easy to be humble. But if you're humble and you've been gifted with beauty, with wealth, with social status, with something, and you're still humble, and not fake humble. You know, fake humble, you know, the fake humble bills. Oh, yeah, I don't know how I do it so well. Like, I, it's so hard to be a millionaire. Like, you know, it's like that kind of stuff. No. But truly humble, that shows you that it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very rare uh, attribute to have, and people who have it says a lot about their character. Number eight, someone who treats the least, most imp the least important person in the world with the same respect as those who are above them. Find the least, most important, least significant person in your life. Person who, like for some reason, a male's bathroom, women's bathroom, I don't know if it has or not, but male's bathroom, sometimes in the fancy restaurants, there's a person there just giving you a napkin and giving you a cologne and stuff like that. No one even pays attention to this person. Or the janitor who's cleaning the place and no one's paying attention to this person. Treating that person with kindness and respect the same way you would treat the president if the president walked through that door. A lot of times you'll see people treat people differently based on their status and what I can benefit from you. And if you see someone treat even the least significant person with respect and with kindness, it says a lot about their uh, personality. And by the way, you will see all these things I'm referring to transform when you are disagreeing and arguing with your spouse. Because you'll see the level of discipline and kindness and their character because all of us, no matter how perfect of a husband or wife you think you'll find, you'll find somebody you are going to argue and fight with them and how you fight makes a world of difference. We're almost done here. Number nine is someone who doesn't give up just because something is hard to do. All of us will go through those challenges and sometimes things are really hard to do. One thing that's hard to do is to get married. Go to these single events, go on using websites, go through your family, tell your friends, talk to people, it doesn't work out. Talk to somebody else, it doesn't work out. Talk to somebody else, it doesn't work out. Man, this is hard. Yeah, but I'm not going to give up. And that says a lot about you. That shows you have resilience. Finally, someone who has a discipline, being able to resist things, even if it gives them pleasure. And what I mean by that is, a lot of times it's hard for us to 
like for brothers, is our challenge is, is lowering the gaze sometimes to see. For the sisters, their challenge is not as difficult for lowering the gaze, but to be seen will be a different challenge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed them with beauty. And so it's harder for like that challenge than it is for brothers. We don't, to all, all due respect, brothers, we are not the beautiful creatures. No, no, like generally, the men are not like Yusuf's story. Right, story of Yusuf is so unique because there's like one Yusuf. Most men, this is the thing that's interesting about sisters and brothers. I didn't have too much time to go over this, but maybe next time, inshallah. But it's interesting how the minds think so differently with the two genders. The majority of sisters do not find the majority of brothers attractive. I'm being honest with you guys. I'll tell you something, sisters, that might surprise you. The majority of brothers find the majority of sisters attractive. It's different. Sisters, if their sister is talking to her friend, and their friend, none of their friends find you attractive, they'll make you a little bit less attractive. But if all her friends find you attractive, they find you suddenly a little bit more attractive. For brothers, it doesn't work like that whatsoever. If all his friends don't find you attractive, it will not make a difference if he finds you attractive or not. If all his friends say she's very attractive, it won't make you attractive if he's not attractive. We're, our brains think differently. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's wisdom in Allah making us different. So we're not trying to force your husband to be like you or your wife to be like you. It's going to frustrate you. Accept the beautiful differences that Allah has made between us. And if you do, it'll give you a lot less uh, struggle with that. Um, and I think my time is done. I have no idea. Are we done? Okay. Yes. Uh, so, no, okay, so I want to make sure I don't go over my time. I'm sorry, I should be looking at my watch more often. Uh, I apologize for any time I went over.